Three. Let us pray. Father, we thank you again for uh, allowing us to take in your word. What a privilege it is to get to know you better and better, to get to know your son better and better. And we thank you for the years of, of you installing your mind in us, in our very souls, through your word. And we ask that uh, what we undertake during this second session will be made clear by God the Holy Spirit to each one in this room and to those who listen by recording. And we ask this in the precious name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Acts 3, verse 1. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the ninth hour, and a man who had been lame from his mother's womb was being carried along, whom they used to set down every day at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, in order to beg alms of those who were entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he began asking to receive alms. But Peter, along with John, fixed his gaze on him and said, Look at us. And I, I do not believe that that was coincidental at all. That was so that we years later could read this and get the emphasis. What These were the apostles. These were the representatives of Christ, the true spiritual representatives of Christ on the earth, in the temple. And they instructed this beggar, look at us. Not that they, they thought they were celebrities or anything like that, but they knew they that that Christ had vested in them the spiritual authority of apostleship. And so Peter, along with John, verse 4, fixed his gaze on him and said, Look at us. And he began to give them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, walk. And seizing him right by the hand, he raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were strengthened. With a le leap, he stood upright and began to walk, and he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. Think about what that says. He entered the temple with them. Where was, the, where was the spiritual center still at that time, at the temple? But who were God's spiritual authorities remaining on earth? The apostles. And I mentioned that the religious leaders recognized this is a sign. Turn, we'll, we'll continue with Acts 3, but turn to ver, uh, Acts chapter 4 just for a minute. Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, and uh, this is the council, otherwise known as the, the Sanhedrin, the the governing body of Israel, the religious leaders, but governing governing body of Israel, and given a certain amount of, of latitude to rule by the Roman Empire. The Romans typically uh, gave a lot of latitude for, for self-rule to uh, the peoples they conquered. Uh, but one thing they wouldn't allow Israel to do was to uh, uh, to apply the death penalty, and that's why th that's why they the religious leaders had to 
to take Christ to Pilate for that to be enacted. Uh, Stephen was stoned by the Sanhedrin, but that was a mob action. And we can only uh, speculate that uh, people can be bribed, and Rome probably looked the other way uh, regarding that. So that it was probably known what happened, but uh, whoever w was in charge of it uh, was bribed or, or something. But in any case, here they are at the council, Verse 15 of Acts chapter 4, but when they had ordered them to lead the council, who had they ordered to lead the council? Peter and John and the, and the healed man. They began to confer, this is the Sanhedrin members, they began to confer with one another saying, what shall we do with these men? For the fact that a noteworthy miracle has taken place through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. So what was their knee-jerk reaction to suppress a sign from God that was given to Israel? And why was this sign, the healing of this man, given? To Israel at the temple. Let's look at verse 9. And all the people, uh, I'm sorry, Acts 3, verse 9. Acts chapter 3, verse 9. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they were taking note of him as being the one who used to sit at the beautiful gate of the temple to beg alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While he was clinging to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them at the, the so-called portico of Solomon, full of amazement. Now notice something about this. They didn't... Uh, Peter and John weren't trying to muster up a crowd to have a miracle service. They, there would have been no crowd gathered except that they performed a miracle that was, uh, I doubt if it was on their schedule for, for the day. It was on God's schedule, but it wasn't on their schedule for the day. But they weren't trying to stir up a crowd like these uh, so-called healers do today. They simply a crowd gathered around them when this lame man whom they had known for years uh, as being a lame man was healed by them. So in verse 11, while he was clinging to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them at the so-called portico of Solomon, full of amazement. That's a, like a long uh, porch on pillars. But when Peter saw this, verse 12, he replied to the people, Men of Israel, why are you amazed at this? Or why do you gaze at us as if by our own power or... And I have the word piety, which is usually translated godliness, which I hate both terms. I, I hate both those religious terms. The word is what is us, usually translated godly or godliness, eusebia in the Greek, E-U-S-E-B-I-A, eusebia. And it means, uh, its root meaning really is rightly directed worship, it means it's really a a one word term to describe the fulfillment of the spiritual life. I think Fritz Reinecker, uh, in his uh, linguistic study of the New Testament, put it quite well. He said it is true reverence for God which comes from knowledge. So, in other words, it's not a religious thing. It is a reverential way of perceiving God through understanding who God is. And he's saying, it's, it, you gaze at us as if by our own power or 
our own spiritual lives or our own reverence for God. Uh, we had made him walk. They realized they didn't make him do anything. God performed a miracle through them in God's perfect timing. And it wasn't because I only bring this out to uh, accentuate the fact that when miracles do occur, they do not occur through anyone's uh, degree of spiritual growth. In other words, they don't. They, uh, miracles don't happen because someone has has uh, studied the Word of God for many, many years and gets to the point where God will perform miracles through them. It does, miracles, miracles happen because miracles are called for at certain times by the wisdom and sovereignty of God, and this was one of those occasions. John the baptizer did not perform miracles. And yet, John the Baptizer was, uh, was I, I think the record shows, had a, a high degree of, of spiritual advancement and was eventually martyred. But miracles are performed, miracles are going to be performed uh, through the ministry of Antichrist, if you read about uh uh, in Second uh, Thessalonians two, I think it is, uh, but and in in Revelation thirteen. Um, in any case, here's the deal. What what was the significance of this? This was indeed a sign for national Israel that Israel, like this lame man had been spiritually destitute for many years and had grown to the point where the people of Israel had really abandoned all hope on any kind of uh, any kind of of real national glory and what this was a sign of, was it was a preview, really, of what could have happened to national Israel had national Israel as a whole, which had to include the governing body of national Israel, had national Israel accepted what was about to be offered. And what was about to be offered was that if Israel would change her mind about her Messiah, that he would return from heaven. And the times of uh, restoration prophesied by the prophets would be fulfilled. Let's look at it in uh, verse 19. Uh, and Peter is still speaking here. Acts 3, verse 19, Therefore repent, that is uh, metanoeo, change your mind and return. In other words, return on course with God so that your sins may be wiped away, that is, your sins of rejection of Messiah, and ultimately taking him to Pilate to be crucified and, and begging that uh, Barabbas be set free uh, instead of Christ when it, it was... Uh, offered that, that uh, one could be set free. In order, verse 19, that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus the Christ, which is, means the anointed. It's a reference to, it emphasizes Christ the Messiah 
or Jesus as the Messiah, appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient time. So what was being offered was if Israel would change, if the nation would change its mind about Christ, Christ would return. Would the seven years of Daniel's 70th week still have to be fulfilled? Yes, but to the, the, much less the intensity of suffering would have been, could have been much less than uh, later on because John didn't write the book of Revelation until uh, well after the offer of the kingdom and rejection of that offer by Israel. And so we have, a, we have an illustration in this beggar, a clear illustration of what could have happened spiritually to Israel, healing, national, spiritual healing for Israel had they followed that man into the temple allegorically. But I, I'm not saying had they all crammed into the temple, but had they gone, had they taken the, the course that man did, recognized the authority of the apostles and, and followed that authority as did the Pentecostal remnant of believers. And among the Pentecostal remnant of believers was a wonderful supernatural manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 4, and so forth. Uh, a, a, an economic system that was very special that could have only occurred through this baptism of the Holy Spirit whereby Christ had baptized with the Holy Spirit. But what happened over a, a, a course of time? Israel rejected the offer, and the, the rejection of that offer, offer crystallized in Acts chapter 7 with the stoning of Stephen by the Sanhedrin, of which Paul was a member and uh, gave consent, voted, yes, yeah, stone him, and they laid uh, Stephen's garments at the feet of this man named Saul, who, uh, whose life changed after that. Uh, in fact, we'll, we'll look at uh, we'll look at some of that change. Let's look at Acts twenty six. This is Paul referring to his conversion. which happened chronologically in Luke's narrative in Acts chapter 9, but several times Paul, uh, when he was witnessing to people, would uh, bring up the subject of how he was saved. He'd give his testimony. Here he was giving his testimony to uh, Agrippa. And... Uh, In verse 16, this is the Lord Jesus speaking, Acts 26, verse 16, where the Lord orders Saul, saying, But get up and stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you, to appoint you a minister or servant and a witness not only to the things which you have seen in that, that blinding vision, on the road to Damascus, the things he had seen, but also to the things in which I will appear to you, rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light 
and from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. So the Lord promised he was going to uh, appear to Saul in the future, and he did over a period of many years probably many times. How do we know this? Because he wrote in uh, A.D. 56 that uh, uh, about six, uh, uh, 26 years after, uh, after his conversion, uh, or a little bit less than that, but he he wrote in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, plural, in which he was seeing Christ, and he even received revelations during that thorn in the flesh incident. He says, a thorn in the flesh was given me to keep me from exalting myself. I was given a thorn in the flesh. A, a messenger from Satan was sent to hammer at me in some way. We don't know how, but uh, to really bother him, to really plague him. And he said twice in the same verse, to keep me from exalting myself. In other words, to keep me from, from becoming arrogant. But here's the point. Uh, here's one point. There's a lot of doctrine in, in that one verse, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7. But here's, here's the point I want to press uh, for this background of what Paul was going into in Romans, that over the course of many years, approximately 30 years, the apostle Paul was receiving experiences of direct revelation from the Lord Jesus Christ, and uh, those revelations had a purpose. Paul was the student, Christ was the teacher. The teacher was teaching the student what to write in his doctrine, because the doctrine was the doctrine of Jesus Christ, the words of Jesus Christ. And if you have a, a red letter edition and uh, you see the words of Jesus Christ uh, throughout the Gospels, and in my red letter edition, they're even here where, where Jesus is speaking to Saul of Tarsus. But uh, uh, I'd like to do a red letter edition that, that uh, makes all of Paul's epistles in red letters too, because they're, they're the words of Jesus Christ. They're no no less important than the words Christ spoke during his ministry or spoke to Saul of Tarsus when Saul was converted. They're the direct words of Jesus Christ. And Paul said in, in Galatians 1, 11, and 12 that, that this gospel that I preach, I didn't receive from man, I received it by revelation of Jesus Christ. And he, he said, when, and I was ordered to go to Jerusalem to set it forth before the other apostles after having great success on my first missionary journey. I was ordered by revelation to go there. That's Galatians 2 verses 1 or 2. I was ordered by revelation to go to Jerusalem to tell the other apostles about what I'm doing. And he said, uh, he wrote in Ephesians that, that I, the prisoner of Christ, for the sake of you Gentiles, because he was under house arrest, but he knew he was, so, uh, he was it was the sovereignty of Jesus Christ, that, uh, that's why he was under house arrest, so I, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, how that by revelation he gave to me 
the mystery, which I wrote about before in brief. He wrote about it in his previous epistles. We, we just looked at it in Romans 11.25, whereby when you read, you may have my insight into the mystery of Christ, into all of that teaching that was undisclosed, totally hidden until it was revealed to the Apostle Paul. How many Christians understand this today? Very few. And, and we, we who do, don't become arrogant about it, don't become conceited about it, but, but recognize what a great privilege we have. And so, Paul was converted. Saul, Saul of Tarsus was converted later to be known as Paul. And let's look at his first miracle, because I, I always, always, always study these two chapters together. You, uh, you, you probably know right now where I'm turning. Where am I turning? <laughs> Anybody know? Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. This is the inauguration of Paul's first missionary journey, right about A.D. 47. How do I know it's A.D. 47? Because Romans was written in A.D. 57. Subtract 10, you get 47. And so, uh, Acts 13, let's take it from verse 4. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they reached Salamis, they began to proclaim the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they, help, they also had John as their helper. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they found a magician, a Jewish false prophet, whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus. The proconsul is, is, had a kind of a governorship position in, in an area. And so this was a Roman, uh, name was Sergius Paulus, verse 7, who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence. This man summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. That is, Sergius Paulus did. But this Jewish false prophet, whose, whose Jewish name was Bar-Jesus in, in verse 6, the same as in verse 7 as Elymas, the magician, in parenthesis, for so his name is translated, so that's, the, that's simply the, the Greek rendering, was opposing them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Okay, got to think about this now. Let it sink in. What was this Jew doing? He was seeking as the this Gentile named Sergius Paulus was summoning Barnas, Barnabas and Saul, seeking to hear the word of God. This Jewish magician opposed them, and he sought to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also known as Paul, verse 9, and this is the first time in this record of the Acts of the Apostles by Luke that it is noted that he is noted as Paul. But Saul who was also known as Paul, Roman name. I just think it's very appropriate. First missionary journey. 
Now he's known as Paul. We've studied his name, uh, the the Roman and Greek uh, names, uh, but Paulus. We we don't have time for that tonight. But verse nine. But Saul, who was also known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, fixed his gaze on him. And said, you who are full of all deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease to make crooked the straight ways of the Lord? Instead of preparing them like John the baptizer was doing them per Isaiah. Verse 11, now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and not see the sun for a time. So this is Paul's first miracle. Quite a shocker. Let's look at it again. Verse 11, now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and not see the sun for a time. He didn't say it would be forever. He said it would be for a time, temporary. And immediately a mist and a darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking those who would lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had happened, being amazed at the teaching of the Lord. So just as the lame man was an illustration of what could have happened to Israel had Israel accepted the offer of Messiah and his kingdom, Paul, performing his first miracle, is causing this, well, God is actually causing it, but causing this Jew to be an illustration of what had happened and continues to happen to Israel nationally goes right along with Romans 11.25 about the partial hardness that is yet temporary. It's actually, it's, it's called blindness in the King James Version, but that's not a, a it's not really a pre precise translation, but it is spiritual blindness. And so, this man went seeking those who would lead him by the hand, as the Jews have, have had to do throughout most of history since that time. In verse 12, Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had happened, being amazed at the teaching of the Lord. So this, uh, to me, is just, uh, this is all astounding. And this is a microcosm of what happened when he went to his very next city. Uh, the, the, he started at the synagogue, and this became the, the pattern. And the Jews rejected, them, rejected him. Some of them believed, but they did nothing. They, they, uh, uh, many of them stirred up for trouble for Paul and, and his companions. And sometimes went so far as to when Paul was headed to another city, they'd, they'd go to and stir up trouble for him at the next city. This is the, the uh, this is the extent that evil goes. But just consider those these two particular 
miracles and their significance and and what went on in between. And so when he, uh, let's uh, look quickly. We got a couple minutes here. Uh, let's let's just take it from verse thirteen. Now, Paul and his companions put out to sea from Paphos and uh, came to Persia in Pamphylia. But John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But going on from. Uh, Persia, they arrived at Pisidian Antioch, and on the Sabbath day they went into the synagogue and sat down. After the, uh, and this, this is Pisidian Antioch, this is not Antioch of, of Syria, where they were, uh, that was kind of their home base. This is Antioch of Pisidia, two entirely different cities. Uh, and so they went in, in verse 14, they went in the synagogue and sat down. Verse 15, after the reading of the law and the prophets, the synagogue officials sent to them, saying, Brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say it. Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, Men of Israel, you who fear God, listen. The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and made the people during their stay in the land of Egypt uh, I'm sorry, made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt, and with an uplifted ar arm, he led them out from it. And he gives a history here. I'm not going to. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but uh, let's get to their response. Uh, verse 42, or uh, no, let's take it from verse. 38. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through him forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and through him everyone who believes is freed, literally justified. That's how it's usually translated, the verb dikaio, justified from all things from which you could not be justified through the law of Moses. So here he is teaching justification apart from the law of Moses, something very, very radical to the Jews. Therefore, take heed, verse 40, so that the things spoken of in the prophets may not come upon you. Behold, you scoffers, and marvel, and perish, for I am accomplishing a work in your days, a work which will never believe, though some should describe it to you. Uh, that is from uh, Habakkuk uh, chapter 1. As Paul and Barnabas were going out, the people kept begging that these things might be spoken to them the next Sabbath. Now, when the meeting of the synagogue had broken up, many of the Jews and of the God-fearing proselytes followed Paul, uh, the proselytes being uh, there were two kinds, don't have time to get into it, but uh, basically Gentiles who were uh, worshiping the God of Israel, followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, were urging them to continue in the grace of God. The next Sabbath, nearly the whole city assembled to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were all filled with jealousy and began contradicting the things spoken by Paul and were blaspheming. Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first, since you repudiate it and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For the Lord has commanded us that is, as Jews, I have placed you as a light for the Gentiles, that's from Isaiah 60, that you may be bring salvation to the end of the earth. And so he's saying you were, you were meant to be 
in the, in the, and will be in the prophetic word, Israel. You will be a light for the Gentiles. That's how you were des- designed to be as a nation, but, but Israel never went that way. In verse 48, when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed, and the word of the Lord was being spread through the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of, women of prominence, and the the in other words religiously devout women of prominence and the leading men of the city and instigated a persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district but they shook off the dust of their feet in protest against uh, them and went to Iconium shaking the dust uh of their feet or or holding a sandal and shaking the dust off it was an obscene gesture uh, uh, comparable to some of the obscene gestures we use today. I think you get the point. In verse 52, and the disciples were continually filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. And so there you have the, the, what happened with Sergius Paulus. Now on a larger scale, they go to a city, start at the synagogue. They say, it was necessary in the plan of God for you to receive this as Jews first. Why? So that God would be vindicated publicly when the Jews rejected uh, when the Jews rejected the the ministry of Paul and his companions. And so they were completely, uh, they were shown to be completely right then in the eyes of anyone who really wanted to know the truth. And at that point, turning to the Gentiles and focusing on the Gentiles. And the Jews did nothing uh, some believed, but but uh, on the whole, they uh, rejected the gospel, and many of them even stirred up trouble for Paul and his companions. And that's the way it went uh, throughout the the journey. And uh, with that, we'll close with prayer. Father, thank you for giving us what you have tonight. Thanking, thank you for uh, sometimes giving us huge chunks, that, but digestible chunks, so that we can understand the sequence during which some of these things took place. And uh, we ask that as we get back into our study of Romans, that uh, through this historical study we'll have a a better frame of reference for the things that Paul is relating in Romans about the Jews, their past, their present, their future, and about the Gentiles as well, and most of all about the Lord Jesus Christ, whose name we pray in. Amen. Amen.